Prairie audio blog. Feel like firing me as a podcaster? Well, take a number. I've been to that rodeo before. As someone who's had a lot of different jobs and a kind of unusual work history, um, I would like to talk about being fired. I've actually only been fired once, technically, though there was one job where I was sort of encouraged to quit, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's actually going to be a point I want to make right out of the gate here. If you feel like your employer wants to get rid of you but doesn't want to actually fire you because they don't want to deal with unemployment issues, don't quit if you can. I mean, sometimes you don't have an option because they cut your hours or they make your life so miserable. But if you can find yourself in a meeting and they're presenting a clear path to you leaving, make sure that you can get them to say the words clearly. You are fired. In my case, I actually pressed twice to hear those golden words. Am I being fired? And then I got a squish answer from a squish person. So I asked it again, am I being fired? Yes, consider yourself dismissed. And there you have it. If you want to, you can file for unemployment. Anyway, if you've read my book Alone Together, you know most of that story. It's actually in the introduction because I got fired from that job about a month before the pandemic, and it it really tied into how I experienced those weird early months. You might remember the Dakota Access Pipeline protest from back in 2016, and I, I think I'll probably talk about some of the behind the scenes stories from writing the book about the protests in a future episode, but the main thing for today is that I learned a lot about covering your backside when you're dealing with people you cannot trust. So there's another big point. The pipeline protest was kind of my first baptism into um, complete distrust of nearly everyone except my closest friends and, and family. Um, up until then, I was, I'm, you know, I was pretty trusting of people, the media. I'm, I was very trusting. I was just raised that way. And after that, things changed. So in regards to getting fired, the most important thing I learned during that protest and in the writing of that book is that in North Dakota, you only have to have one party who know, who needs to know that a recording is being made. So because of the weird stuff that was happening during that, during that protest, you know, there were harassing emails, phone calls, doxing, that kind of stuff. I just got into the habit of recording conversations when I'd run into a protester in town. I recorded phone calls made to me. Um, I downloaded voice messages, made screenshots of everything. That's just That became a habit over a year's time, and that just stuck with me. It's that moment when your your spidey sense starts to tingle that something isn't right. Well, that's the moment you need to know your recording laws in your state. And so in the last half of 2019, my spidey, stent, my, my spidey sense started to tingle. So I admit it took me about three years to realize something was amiss to get to that point. And that meant um, after I was fired, I actually apologized to some people because I had believed wrong things about them, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but at that point, when when I realized something's not right, I started to gather proof, just like I did during the protest. And it wasn't because I had a personal vendetta, but because of forgetfulness, because of, of gaslighting, and because of the power of authority. So this was a job at a church, and people have a tendency to believe the pastor over some female employee. Uh, heck, I would I would even have that tendency, even if I was the one making the claim. And it's it's because of tradition, sure, but also because of, of the element of time. Time is like a catalyst or an amplifier when you put it into any kind of equation. So multiply habits in time and you get a life to the nth degree of the kind of habits you made. Or um, multiply memory in time, you get a week in memory. And multiply your, your cartilage in time and you get a lot of grumbling at the gym. I know that one. Anyway, you put time into anything and it it changes the result over time. And, you know, God is outside of time, which is, I suppose, one of the reasons he never changes. But part of the situation I was in, I was concerned about the passage of time because I was watching um, manipulation and gaslighting. And I was concerned that over time I'd, I'd forget or I would be easily led to believe that I was misremembering something. And, of course... In a church situation, there's a kind of built-in vulnerability. Faith is a big deal to me, and it's it's really easy to to trap me by cherry-picking a Bible verse and using it in a way that's wrong or hurtful in, in that situation. And then you end up with all kinds of confusion and guilt and fear. And I will say that church jobs are not for the faint of heart because you see you, you kind of see the worst of people anyway, and then some of that gets wrapped in confusing religious talk. During the pandemic, the term 
gaslighting became popular. Now, I wasn't as fam- familiar with it prior to then. I mean, I'd heard of it, but it's a kind of psychological abuse where um, one person makes another person question their sanity, question their memory or understanding of something that's happened. And it's so, e- it's, it's incredibly easy to do this to someone. Oh, but you said this. I never said that. Really? I would swear I heard you say that. No, no, I never said that. And so, you know, you, you, you can, if somebody isn't really certain about something, you can easily cause them to agree that they're wrong. So it's difficult to hold your ground and assert that you did indeed have a correct memory, particularly if no one else believes you or cares to hear your story. And, you know, this happened a lot. I, I would see or hear something that I was told I did not see or hear that. And it was, it was, I cannot tell you how confusing that was to me because, you know, especially when the person doing it not only has positional authority, you know, the job positional authority, they're, they're up, they're higher than you, but there's also a spiritual authority over you. It's so dangerous. Not only could they fire you, but they can make you question your, your faith. Like how good of a Christian are you? If, if that's even a thing. So that's why I began recording and gathering proof. It was, it was as much for my own sanity to go back and see that, okay, yes, that really did happen. That really was said. I wasn't confused or making it up. Thing is, no one cared. I mean, you know, the same church leaders that in the days prior to getting canned, you know, they'd been saying, hey, you're doing a great job. We're going to give you a raise, which, you know, I I imagine the gal who was waiting in the wings for my job probably got my raise. But, you know, these were the same people who said that I was doing a great job. They they loved having me there. They couldn't imagine not having me there. Thank you for all you're doing, blah, blah, blah. They just went radio silent. And I I want to say that I'm surprised. But again, the pipeline protest taught me a lot. And I'll be blunt here. Testosterone is wasted on too many. I mean, women led too many of the informational and counter-protest fights during the protests, and they absolutely led way too many of the fights during the pandemic. Whether it was school board, um, legislature, it, it was just, there's too many women having to go and do the leading. And these were male church leaders, and I heard nothing from them. I went from great employee to a pariah, and you know, at least I knew from what I'd been gathering as part of my, my little pile of proof that one of the tricky bits at work in this situation is prepping people to accept a kind of a planned outcome. And it's, it's like gaslighting in the long game. So let's say, imagine you're a leader and, and the, the pandemic, this won't be hard for you to imagine if, you've, if you made it through the pandemic. So imagine you're a leader and you have a few people that make your life less easy. Maybe they're not, you know, bobbleheads. They're not yes menning you for everything. So you'd like to get rid of them, but you also don't want to be seen as the bad guy. And, you know, maybe other people really like these people or they're fond of them or they, they just wouldn't go along with it if you came right out and made a move against them. So you have to grease the skids a little bit. Well, I'm having a problem with so-and-so, the leader might say to the others several months ahead of the planned removal event. Just something subtle, gentle, not such a big deal. You know, you just kind of gently plant the idea that a person is a problem. You, you gently imply that a situation is their fault and that you're just simply relaying facts, not opinion. And you repeat this over time because yes, time is back at work. And you program people to accept something as true. You prepare them to agreeably accept the outcome that you want. They, they won't even question it. We know this from our own media and you know big tech and um, you know how they've just been controlling information. We know that when you gradually release an idea and then you kind of gently up the ante each time, it makes it so we're more ready to accept the final conclusion that they've led us to all along. And of course, in a church setting, Matthew 18, 15 is always used. You know, the idea where you have to go to the person that you have the problem with, but it's always used in one direction. And so during the meeting where I got fired, I was told that if you had a problem with me, you should have come to me instead of a deacon. And, you know, I almost laugh because that is that is on my list of Bible verses we use to shut down anyone trying to raise a concern. Do we ask whistleblowers to go to their superiors first, the ones doing the wrong thing? No. Why? Because there's a power difference. When you see that the people before you had been 
gently removed over a long process of time, you know you're not special. The same thing is going to happen to you if you get on the wrong side of a person that does this. And so I'd seen church leaders and families just kind of quietly leave their positions and sort of disappear into the ether, never to return to the church, never really acknowledge. They're just sort of gone. Troublemakers, gone, easy peasy. You know, Matthew 18 goes in both directions. The church leaders didn't come to me and ask me what had happened. And in the months leading up to the firing where I, I came to learn that a negative idea was planted about me, no one actually asked me if that was true. Well, the actual moment of when the hammer dropped and the month or so after it were a bit topsy-turvy overall. I mean, you, you, you lose your jobs, you get, you know, you lose your routine, your habit, your, your income. Um, I, I wasn't terribly surprised Things were going on that were distressing to me for a while, things that had caused me to revert to what I learned during the pipeline protest when I realized you couldn't trust somebody. And I remember specifically at the end of 2019 on the last um, night of a Christmas Bible study I had led, I was speaking with a woman on our way out the door. I was kind of closing down, clean, everything was cleaned up, and she just was kind of chatting with me as I was putting everything away. And she said to me, Um, I feel like 2020 is going to be a big year, she said. Had no idea really what was coming. But she said that she felt like, you know, there's going to be something monumental, that we we get a real vision of something like 2020 eyesight. And it really clicked with me because I said, you know, I I agree. I felt like like something was shifting. I wasn't sure, but it, it felt like God had been kind of prodding my heart, like there's change coming. And, um... You know, I had been feeling distressed about what I was seeing at my work for a while. And then and then I saw the treatment of a fellow employee in the months leading up to it. I mean, that that made me almost sick. My parents could vouch for it. My friend, I mean, I documented it. It wasn't good. And I'd actually started quietly taking um, home some of my personal things from the office. I just got the sense that God said, start bringing some of that home. So. In 2020, the first year I was actually given a paid vacation, very exciting. Um, I had planned a vacation in January and one in the fall, and God made it really clear. He said, take your paid vacation right away in January. Don't wait until later in the year like you'd planned. So during that January vacation, um, I was highly inspired to write a short book about good and bad leadership because I guess I knew what was next. I, I saw the gears moving. So record, make photos and copies, gather your proof, even if no one believes you or even if no one bothers to even ask why a, quote, great worker would suddenly be fired, even if they've been led to believe over several months that you're, you're bad or you're a problem, at least you will know that you're not crazy, that you, you have some, some valid reasons. Um, You know, one of the things people would say to me is just stop talking about it, let it go, don't cause trouble, just be quiet, move on. I I get it. Um, But, you know, one woman from the church started stalking my Facebook page to report back to church leadership. I I hope they enjoyed my cat photos and my pandemic posts about vitamin D. I'm sure that was exciting. Um, I was sent a copy of an email that revealed people were being told something that wasn't true about my dismissal, something that made me look bad. It kind of damaged my reputation as if I'd, I'd done something uncouth. And, you know, as I wrote back in the September 25th blog post about the importance of a good name, that, that kind of thing really hurt me because that affected my name. You know, in a moment of annoyance, I will admit that I told my friend that people get the leader that they deserve and I wouldn't sit under that leader again for nothing. And I said that no matter what kind of church growth they get, it doesn't matter because weeds can grow pretty fast too. Now that wasn't very kind. Um, about a year later, one woman from the church sent me a, a, a really nice card. She wrote in it that she wanted me to know I was missed and that there was nothing wrong with who I was and that she had come to you know, a few of the Bible studies I'd led and that she'd enjoyed them. And I actually carry that card in my Bible to this day. It, you know, it really meant a lot to me. It was kind of like someone said, hey, Julie, God used you. Your hard work wasn't for nothing. You you mattered. You know, getting fired is one thing, but getting fired from your church and ending up losing your, your church family is something else. It's has like the unfortunate effect of making me very wary about trying to connect or volunteer at any church ever again going forward. And right now I only see two people from that church, an older couple, they still attend there. And I I absolutely love them. Here's the thing though, it it hadn't just been a job, it had been kind of a ministry. 
and you know I'm an introverted person um I'm I'm alone a lot you know this was like the first time I really had this really direct opportunity to 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 do something for God for with people you know so many people walk into a church office it's not just an office job they come in and they have all kinds of needs some might not speak great English and they need me to help fill out a form and talk to a social service office on their phone on their behalf or some need help paying rent or they needed prayer because something bad had just happened and all they could do is walk into the nearest church I mean those are things that happened a lot of people would come into the church um, and you know, and I had a chance to lead Bible studies and organize special events, and and um, you know, I spent I spent my own money, and I gave extra time off the clock to connect with people, which again, that's a big deal for me because I'm not a people person, but I really wanted to do this for God, and so I took, you know, I, t- I had a turn as a piano player on the worship team, and I guess just for a few sh- short years, it felt like God was really using me in a way that I could actually see that I could invest time and money into what He was doing. I felt like I belonged somewhere that I had a life that mattered to his kingdom and it was wonderful and then just like that it was gone you had your ministry opportunity taken from you is what a friend told me as I attempted to figure out why this bothered me so bad when I just lost basically an office job it it wasn't all that great of a paying one and so I couldn't figure out why this bothered me because it seemed like a really bad thing but now three years later I can see that it was one of the best things God could have done for me because A season of craziness was about to descend on the nation and the world in just four weeks after I got fired. And I ended up being in an ideal situation, being able to work from home, um, just having the time to think and write about all the things that were happening. But, you know, I still have a sense of loss about the ministry. I've always been really active in helping at church. And since then, I no longer am. I don't connect well with church people now because what I learned is that they can forget you in an afternoon. Um... They can believe the worst about you. Church elders don't even have the courage to come and talk to you. Um, I guess I'm wary of getting involved because I've seen how the sausage is made and the disillusionment is is permanent. I don't trust a single church leader I see at this point. I mostly just attend. But in the current climate of the world and the craziness we're seeing creeping into the church today, maybe it's a gift from God. Maybe this is part of my lesson, you know. Don't blindly trust human church leadership. This is not the time to be so trusting of our religious leaders. I could wrap this up in a lot of ways, and I bet you wish I would. But what I want to touch on is when people tell you to be quiet and just move on. Yes, you have to move on someday. Ten years of talking to a therapist about the same wounds leaves you wounded for ten years, not healed. I get it. But I want to say that when something bad happens to you, you don't have to pretend that it didn't. Some folks get after me anytime I mention this incident. They just, they don't understand that it wasn't just a simple thing. That when your entire life from childhood to now has been church, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Bible camp, evangelistic crusades, discipleship camp, youth convention, VBS. I mean, if the doors are open, we were there. I practically lived in the church. This kind of thing is, is gut-wrenching. It is a severing of trust in a permanent way that I will never be that same Julie again. Which, maybe that was the point. You can move on. You have to move on. You have to forgive, but you do not have to forget. Forgiveness is a process, generally, I've found. When a bad thought comes up about this person, I have to work on it. So some days I feel like, yes, I've forgiven them, and then another day something will happen, something will you know, trigger their memory, and I'll be angry, and I have to do it all over again, and that's just how it is. But I can honestly say, I don't wish that pastor ill, because I know God uses jars of clay, and he'll use both the pastor and myself, but I will absolutely never trust him again in any way. And I probably won't trust any pastor, really, after this situation, so... Anyway, forgiveness isn't always forgetfulness. Not forgetting, it's not about holding on to grudges, but it's more about Matthew 10, um, 16 through 17. In the NIV, that reads, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. So yeah, you're going to get nailed by a lot of worldly systems in the coming days and years because they hate Jesus and they are going to only hate him more tomorrow. But you're also going to get it from religious institutions in ways that you didn't see coming. And I've got to forgive because that's the innocent part of that verse. But I cannot forget because that's the shrewd part. You have to learn from what you've been through. It's supposed to change you, though whether or not you forgive could be 
it's changing you for the good or for the bad. You know, I did move on. I, I did. I changed churches, my denomination, my life. I learned some really valuable lessons about people, churches, church leadership. I'm, I'm much less trusting and gullible. I'm more cautious. I don't trust and believe everything coming out of the pulpit, and that's not bad. But I want to give you some practical takeaways when it comes to your job, which might not be at a church. So if you think you're going to get canned, what should you do? Pay attention to what's happening. Gather your proof, even if it's just for your own sanity, doing it in a legal way. So for me, I took notes, photos, made photocopies, and I still have it all. It's neatly filed away. I recorded meetings, um, including that last meeting where I got fired, which was good because when people asked the church about the reason I was fired and they were given that incorrect answer, that deceptive answer, my first thought was, wow, did I, did I actually do that? And so I felt terrible. And then I had to go back and listen to my own recording to be reminded that I had not done any such thing. So do that. Write down the story, the specifics, facts of what happened, what you thought about it, why you did, what you did, how you reacted, what you felt, everything that you can remember. And then file it all away because you're going to overall in time remember the lesson learned you don't need to dwell on the details the details are what will make you angry they'll make it harder to forgive it's the lesson you need to remember if you ever need the information someday for whatever reason sure you can pull it out but just file it away and then see what God has for you down the road not a day hasn't gone by since I'm not glad that I got out of the place when I did and I While I don't understand the loss of the ministry opportunity, I know this. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Are you a good leader? A bad one? Is someone coming to mind when I talk about either of those? Find out how a good leader is different from a bad leader. And from now until October 31st, get 20% off your download of the leadership ebook found at LonePrairie.net using coupon code DECISIONS20. Did you ever see the 1990s football movie, The Replacements? I love that movie. (laughs) Oddly, many of the jobs that I've quit have been kind of like a soft quit, where once in a while the employer would have me come back and help out between replacement employees. But there are other times I've quit a job. I quit a job at a grocery store because the the delivery man kept harassing me in the break room and I just, that was enough. Um, I quit a job at a t-shirt shop because the drive was, there was a long drive and, and gas was expensive and the minimum wage I think at that point was maybe $7. Um, and so I just couldn't make it work, but frequently I would go back and work there when the, the lady who owned the store would ask when she's in between employees. And at one point, just to kind of save money on the gas, I actually camped in an abandoned building next to the store with permission, um, to save on that 45 mile drive. But that's a whole other story. Um, I've worked seasonal jobs, which means they have an end date built in. And I had a job at a startup where they had a uh, special unscheduled employee meeting just for me in which it was made kind of clear they wanted me to quit. And so I I did. I hadn't intended to, but I guess I should have made them fire me. Sometimes I go and read their glass door employee reviews and uh, thank God I got out. The first time I ever drew a set of angrymancartoon.com images was to illustrate the different ways you could quit your job. And if you go to my website, you can actually still find them there as a little ebook. And in those cartoons, um, you'll learn about six different kinds of job quitters. There's the amber alert quitter, the person who's just stopped showing up and is finally noticed as absent. There's the bridge burner quitter, the person who just, they, they snap and they tell everyone what he really thinks about them before storming out the door. There's the dream on quitter who has sort of broken down into a disheveled heap of humanity and still asks for a reference for their next job. There's the grab as you go quitter who steals office supplies and whatever isn't nailed down on the way out the door. And then um, there's, I think there was the can't let go quitter who won't stop saying goodbye and just milks the departure for all it's worth. Then there's the the ticker tape parade quitter who makes sure to let everybody know that they're going to do a hugely meaningful and much better job after they leave this one. When I quit that startup job, um, I remember that day, the clock rolled around to three. I I would show up for work at 6 a.m. And um, one of the bosses was, I don't know, in Kansas or something to a conference. And um, they'd actually had me stay on for three weeks 
from my resignation. Um, And then they told me not to announce it to anyone that I was leaving. So I had to pretend for three weeks that everything was fine. Um, Anyway, that day at three, uh, I, I just turned my computer off. I dumped a few items I had on my desk into my backpack, and then I stood up to just walk out the door. And I think at that point, the remaining boss who was still there, he caught my eye and he stood up and he cleared his throat. And, you know, it's a startup. I think I was the only girl there. And so all the people took their headphones off and they look up and the boss says some some words about, you know, hey, we're sorry to see Julie go, blah, blah, blah. Here's a cookie bouquet for all your hard work. Goodbye. And um, I just quietly walked out the door holding an awkward bundle of cookies, stumbling down the sidewalk eight blocks to my apartment. And I went up the stairs, sat down at my little kitchen table. I looked out the window at the sunny day and I cried. So what kind of a quitter am I, considering those Angry Man cartoon? Well, I'll tell you, I'm a six months emergency savings account quitter because God is good all the time. Hey, thanks for not quitting me today. Visit my website at lonepray.net for contact information and links. And links to any websites or products are in the episode description page at julienidlinger.com. Catch you next time.